by Valeria Petorino, and she will tell us about exploring the universe with Python. Please welcome Valeria. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thanks a lot for being here. And uh, I'd like uh, first to thank uh, the organizers uh, um, or, or live on, on YouTube uh, for the opportunity to talk here. I will discuss how we can use Python in cosmology to unveil the universe and, in particular, the dark universe. I'm Valeria Pettorino. And I'm a physicist, so just let me briefly introduce myself. I'm a physicist, I work in astrophysics and cosmology, so the study of the understanding of the origin, the evolution, and the content of the universe. <coughs> I, I, I work in particular for two space missions. In fact, the lights were fantastically down before. <laughs> for two space missions financed by ESA and uh, the European Space Agency and NASA. So the first one is Planck satellite that was launched in uh, 2009 and we released the uh, data uh, last year for cosmology. And the other one is this beautiful one, Euclid space mission that will be launched in 2020. And uh, <coughs> yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you more about that uh, afterwards. I've, I've been um, also uh, working a lot on communication. I've been in charge of the communication, internal communication for the Euclid space mission and uh, public outreach for two years. I'm also very much interested uh, in uh, data science. I've been working uh, separately for a um, healthcare project for a startup in London for um, uh, some time for uh, an IoT project, but that's, uh, that's a different story. But I mentioned that because I've recently also become ambassador for the S2DS program. So before we go to cosmology, let me also tell you about this program. It's um, science to data science. Um, it's the largest data science bootcamp in Europe. It's a five week program that happens twice per year, one virtually, one in a place in London. And it really aims at joining the academic community with data science experience. Um, the ambassador program in particular aims to build a network between scientists from academia and outside the data science community. And uh, they support talks, uh, also covering partly expenses, uh, if one wants to organize some event. Uh, I'll probably, I'll be moving actually to Paris in a few months, and I'll probably be organize a data science uh, workshop next year. So if you're interesting, interested in taking part or be part of this community, uh, please contact me or just look at the web for the ambassador program. Okay, so let's... Uh, look at cosmology now and let's first uh, understand a bit at which distances, which scales are we talking um, about. Well, human beings uh, are more or less uh, of dimensions of uh, a meter, roughly, in this uh, um, scale. And if you go down to smaller scales, then you reach the interest fields for chemistry, for atomic physics, for nuclear physics, down to 10 to the minus 15 meters, and even lower scales, the scales of particle physics, where the Large Hadron Collider at CERN is working, or at those very small distances detected that we heard yesterday um, on, from gravitational waves. But now I would like to bring you up in the other direction at very large distances, beyond human beings, beyond Earth, beyond the Sun, in the domain of astrophysics and cosmology. So we start our journey across the cosmos from our planet, Earth, which is one of the planets in our solar system, this blue dot right there. And the whole solar system is here in the edge of the spiral of our galaxy, which is the Milky Way. So here we are at about 10 to the 21st, 21 
uh, meters. But we want to go, and we can actually go, we have the power to look much farther than that. In fact, this is a picture, I don't know if it's too bright to see anything, <coughs> but that's, that's a photo from, uh, taken from the Hubble Space Telescope, financed by NASA, in which every single point in this picture is a galaxy like our Milky Way. And we can go even, even farther, and for that I'd really like, like the light, if possible, to be <laughs> even lower. If there is anyone there <laughs> before I start, because otherwise you won't see anything of the next slide. <laughs> and also, I mean, it's a dark universe, so somehow... <laughs> Okay, that's already great. That's already much better, thanks. So that's, a, again, a picture of all the galaxies around us, but we can go even farther. So if you imagine that you are somewhere in the center, let's say, of this video, and you go far away from these uh, galaxies, then uh, these are all galaxies which have been observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, a collaboration uh, that observed about one million galaxies and they're just placed around in space as they've observed them. And as you go farther and farther from our galaxy, you, you see that they don't really uh, fill out the whole space, but they actually form a web. They form voids, places where there's no galaxies, and filaments, places where there's lots and lots and lots of galaxies. And this is all really, I mean, observed by the Sloan Digital Sky Survey. So th this is what is called the cosmic web. In addition, we know that the universe is expanding. This already since, uh, since a long time. So in the sense that really distance between galaxies, the space itself in between galaxies is stretching. And for a long time, the expansion has decelerated, so just gone slower and slower due to gravity that tries to pull things together and slow down this expansion, which is also what you see here. So there's like slowing down. And then suddenly, about five billion years ago, <laughs> it started to accelerate. These expansions started to accelerate very, very faster and faster. And this was discovered only in 1998. It was a huge, huge surprise that got these three people a Nobel Prize in physics in 2011 for the discovery of the acceleration of the universe. And right now, the universe is, is accelerating, is in this phase of accelerated expansion. Now, since then, since 1998, there have been several experiments, and so a lot, a lot of uh, data coming from different experiments from ground in space, different collaborations, looking at different things, and they all seem to point out towards the same surprising picture of the universe. A universe which is mainly dark. So atoms, ordinary atoms, ordinary matter, all human beings, and basically stars, they all account for at most 5% of the total energy budget in the universe. The rest is completely, basically, unknown. <laughs> and is, we, we know that it's partly for about 25% in the form of dark matter. So that's a form of matter that still feels gravity and it's like the glue that forms uh, galaxies, that keeps galaxies together. And even more, more mysteriously, about 70% of our uh, universe uh, energy budget is in the form of dark energy. That's dark in the sense that it does not emit light. We haven't actually seen, detected the particle of dark energy yet. 
or dark matter yet. But we know that it's responsible for this accelerated expansion of the universe. And so understanding 95% of the universe, as you notice, is like uh, almost embarrassing. So it's, it's, it's uh, the, the major challenge at, mo at the moment and for the next generation of experiments. And this is, this is a cosmic uh, vision of really having the big picture, understanding, again, 95% of the energy that surrounds us. But it's also, it's also a big data challenge that joins a lot of different communities uh, together. So there is already a new generation of experiments, uh, among which the next one to be launched, again, is the Euclid space mission, which are going to use different probes to scan the sky, slice it at different epochs in time. So they're, they're going to observe, for example, the shapes of billions of galaxies at different epochs in time. And this is, this is a huge challenge. It's a, it's a challenge uh, from the technological point of view because you have to, of course, uh, predict the technology and build a new technology to, uh, for, to have, uh, let's say, the the resolution that allows you to, to discriminate among all the possible theoretical models that it can explain dark energy, uh, to actually build a detector, to actually transfer the signal and compress it, so the whole signal processing uh, challenge uh, to understand, uh, to, to reconstruct the shape of, of the galaxies and to compress the data that comes from space and to, ex and to actually in interpret it in terms of uh, comparison with the theoretical models. Uh, to finally, all together, test gravity and uh, fundamental physics at very large scales. Like we do in, in at very small scales. So testing forces, testing interactions at very large scales, like people do at the LHC at CERN, for example. And I would like to stress that this is not the work of a single astronomer, a single person that looks, I don't know, dry, uh, writes down strange uh, equations on the blackboard or, or looks at the telescope uh, from, from somewhere. This is really um, an enterprise in a way. This is uh, uh, work that involves huge, large collaborations. So I'll, I'll tell you something about the two in which I'm in. The first one is Planck. And uh, this, is, this is a collaboration of about 100 scientific institutes in Europe, in the US, and in Canada. It involves about 500 people. And uh, I've, for that, I've been leading the analysis that compares the data from the satellite to theoretical models that uh, predict uh, dark energy and, uh, and the theories beyond general relativity, so modified gravity. The other mission, Euclid, is more than twice as big. So at the moment, it includes 1,300 people from 120 labs, 13 European countries, plus US, NASA, and Berkeley labs. So for that, I am, I am uh, in particular, apart from working on the communication, I've, I've, uh, I'm in charge of the whole forecasting activity to determine a reliable pipeline that can uh, tell us how well Euclid will perform in, uh, in discriminating among different theories. Okay, so let me um, tell you a bit, uh, uh, let's say more in detail what we actually observed and how we actually analyzed the data and of course where we used Python in it. And I'll do that for, in particular, for Planck. Planck was launched in uh, 2009, and we collected uh, terabytes of, uh, of data. It was sent 1.5 million kilometers away from Earth, orbiting along, around the second Lagrangian point, somewhere again on the opposite side with respect to the Sun. 
and uh, it scanned the entire sky twice per year. So the spacecraft spins with one rotation per minute and uh, it traces circles in the sky, observing the radiation in all direction at different frequencies. So it contains uh, uh, two instruments, one at low frequencies and one at high frequencies. And the high frequency part had to have a very complex cryogenic system that uh, had to cool down the, the whole detector down to 0.1 Kelvin. So it was literally the coolest place in the universe for a while. It observed in all directions, as you see, all the radiation. And what you see here is, is the emission also from our uh, galactic plane along this line, which actually for us is a background. We remove it. We don't want to see the galaxy, the, our galaxy, the light from our galaxy. What we want to see is something which is much more challenging, what we actually saw, it's something which is much more challenging, which is the light, the cosmic microwave background that was emitted 13 billion years ago. And, and this is a map of it. This is uh, one of the main uh, results, uh, outputs from the Planck uh, collaboration, in which you see this is a microwave uh, radiation and the, the different colors uh, correspond to different temperatures. So tiny, tiny differences in temperature in this radiation. The mean temperature is about three Kelvin, so it's very, very cold. That's why the, the detector had to be so cold, even colder than that. But we, we actually, uh, what we are actually interested in is this tiny, tiny differences in temperature when we, you look at different directions. So all these are like hot and, and uh, cold, spots when you look in different directions. And uh, there, there um, we have such an amazing resolution of, of this map that we can understand how this light traveled down to us and from there understand the evolution of the universe and reconstruct the, the content of the universe itself. So that's really sort of similar to what you would do a, a map of the temperature on Earth on the top, where you would go up to, I don't know, 40 degrees or even higher in Bilbao recently. <laughs> or, but just on the sky. So this is three kel around 3 Kelvin, so minus 270 uh, degree centigrades. And really you see tiny, tiny differences of one part of uh, 10 to the fifth of something that was emitted 13 billion years ago. And that gives you a resolution uh, on, uh, say, on, on the parameters that describe your universe, on the amount of dark energy, dark matter, and the expansion of the universe uh, with the resolution of the, at the percent level. So I think that's, I don't know, just uh, almost uh, astonishing. And, uh, and most of the analysis is actually in the whole processing of the data in uh, trying to get rid of all the other sources, all the individual point sources that for which we have yeah, catalogs that we just remove. We remove the radio emission from the Milky Way. This Milky Way is really annoying, let's say, for, <laughs> for us. <laughs> we remove all the dust emission, again, from our lovely Milky Way which is in itself, however, of course, uh, of interest for other communities that, that, I mean, study that in particular, in order to unveil the, the cosmic microwave background. And this was a result that, I mean, you might have also seen this map. Uh, it was uh, kind of uh, advertised in basically all newspapers uh, in the front page. What we actually get, of course, it's not really the map. It's uh, something terrible happened. Ah, proprio ci si è chiuso completamente. It uh, disintegrated. Just a moment.
Okay. So we, what we get is just uh, time order data, the beginning, that, that's an example of three minutes of raw data that we get from the satellite. And then this is, most of the analysis is really in processing this data. And uh, for that we used uh, uh, several classes uh, all over the world, basically. Uh, this is, um, the, the main data processing center are uh, in, uh, in Italy and France, both for Planck and uh, for Euclid. <coughs> and they collect uh, basically yeah, terabytes uh, of, of data. And for the next generation of experiments, we really expect uh, also from radio telescopes to have about terabytes per minute of data that um, arrive. So there's uh, all this information that comes from the satellite that arrives uh, at the Mission Operation Center in Germany, and then it's transferred to Italy and France, where there is the data processing uh, center, and then it's transferred to the whole community, basically, again, around the world in different institutes, and there's different groups with that, that they extract from those data, clean up all the, all the data, and, and extract these, uh, these, these maps. There are challenges between different groups to understand which one performs better. We then uh, extract from them, we, we project in spherical harmonics to, to identify, let's say, the, the, the dependence in, uh, at different angles in which we are looking at. And for all this process, there's actually, as it was mentioned actually in the talk before, there's lots of different codes by different people uh, um, written in different languages. Uh, so for the extraction, for example, of the maps, uh, lots of them actually are in IDL and uh, use ILPIX. Uh, lots of, uh, which un it's unfortunate in the sense it's not even open source. Uh, there's uh, lots of Python in it. There's lots of C, C++, some MATLAB, uh, and uh, yeah, from all of that, so from terabytes of data, we can extract the power spectrum. So really the, the data, that that's uh, on the y-axis, you see again the temperature perturbations, temperature differences at different scales as a function of the spherical harmonics, so as a function of the angular scale. This is very large angular scales and this is very small, tiny angular scales angular scales. And then there is a whole process in which you have to try to compare this with theoretical models and fit that somehow. And the fit that I'm showing you is exactly the one that corresponds to the pi that I showed you before. So the thing is if, uh, in fact I can probably show you this uh, here that you can find online. So depending on the amount of atoms of uh, dark matter, of dark energy that you put in it, you get different kind of predictions, different kind of curves. So for example, if you all have 100% uh, atoms, only atoms, then you would get this kind of curve that, as you obviously see, does not fit the data. So if you, uh, in order to fit the data, you need uh, to decrease the amount of atom, atoms even more, and decrease the amount of dark matter, and as you see, all the predictions are uh, changing. And uh, there's other parameters uh, on the expansions, and when the reunitization takes place, and uh, initial conditions. And finally, hopefully, if you have only 70% of dark energy, then you can actually finally um, yeah, uh, match the data. Now, obviously, we don't do that, that uh, in, in this way. <laughs> we have to analyze the whole region of parameter space and uh, use uh, several tools. There is a whole collection of tools which is available in the cosmology in the NASA website. I'll show you here. And all these codes are all uh, open source, and they're all uh, available, you can all play with them. There's uh, uh, yeah, several of them. <coughs> yeah. 
So for the future uh, missions, uh, Euclid uh, in particular, the whole sounds ground segment and also all the forecasting activity that I lead uh, have chosen Python as the recommended uh, language, so most of, uh, of it will be in Python. Uh, for the actual interpretation, at least uh, for the interpretation of the, um, of the Planck um, data, of course you need to do simulations. We use uh, Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain to compare the data with uh, the whole parameter space of, um, of, of the theoretical models, of the predictions of the theoretical models. And uh, we use uh, yeah, Bayesian analysis with that. So we try to, to build chains that reconstruct the posterior distribution. So the, the probability to have uh, that model given those data. And we have <coughs> uh, several tools for that. But in particular, there is one uh, that uh, I want to mention because it's written in Python. And it's a code which is open source. It's called Monty Python. It's a Monte Carlo code written in Python. Uh, you can find it on, uh, on GitHub. There's uh, documentation. And the main developers are Benjamin Audran and uh, Julien Lescourge, plus many, many others. So this, for example, will also be used um, also I mean, for the forecasting activity in, in Euclid. Now, all this is, uh, requires uh, to deal with complex data and also to combine data that come from different sources, from different experiments, <coughs> and that op sometimes, I mean, look at different things, so at, like different parameters. You have to deal with several free parameters, uh, the ones that describe your cosmology, so the amount of matter, the amount of, uh, uh, of dark energy, the expansion, and so on, order of 10 parameters per cosmological model, plus about 10 to 100 parameters that describe the instrument and all the systematics uh, involved in it. So we need to sample very efficiently in parameter space. There's different uh, possible samplers that are used and also integrated in uh, Monty Python. For a long time, the, um, people have used uh, and are still using, let's say, uh, code, which actually was written in uh, Fortran uh, 90, and that at is a <coughs> sort of part of it is now phagocitated uh, by Python, um, which is called uh, Cosmo MC. <coughs> And Monty Python is a more recent version, for the moment written in, uh, in Python 2. Uh, of course, uh, it guarantees that it's much more concise with respect to the previous uh, uh, code that was used. Um, it, uh, it allows to run uh, with, I mean, much more stable uh, Monte Carlo chains for, for days, uh, investigating parameter space. And uh, it also allows to have a much more moduled structure in which we you have to understand that basically this, this in has to interface uh, with different codes that, for example, deal with the data from different experiments uh, or with different samplers in parameter space or uh, with the different codes that uh, solve the actual uh, equation that describe the universe from the Big Bang down to us. So all these modules are written uh, sometimes also in different languages and uh, they're all integrated uh, within uh, Monty Python. So that's a sort of uh, uh, schema of the modularity of this uh, Monty Python uh, uh, part. That's the part here, for example, integrated here with class, which is a code, a code in C <coughs> that solves uh, the whole evolution of the background. All the top is, uh, comes from different uh, data sources. And then there's all different samplings uh, here on the right hand side. This is also, so Monte Python recently, uh, so it's also on Binder. Uh, so if you go, for example, to the, <coughs> the link on the top, you can also see um, part of the, of the class uh, GitHub repository uh, transformed into IPython uh, notebooks. And you can play with it. And it, it includes examples and repository with previous uh, results. What is not yet optimal in Python, at least for this project, uh, for us, is mainly that uh, it's slow uh, for what we need to do uh, for for the for especially I mean some some parts. 
uh, the previous the previous code uh, that was written in Fortran at least I mean has a, has a huge let's say is integrated with the Open MPI and one can run uh, simultaneously lots of different chains and also run everything on a grid so that basically you, you investigate very quickly a large fraction of parameter space. This is not yet integrated uh, into the Monty Python part uh, and uh, Monty Python uses MPI for PI, but uh, of course it would be much um, useful, much more useful to have something uh, like OpenMPI and um, yeah, so in fact uh, if you have uh, any ideas or or um, yeah, on how we to improve that, uh, we, we need input uh, from the data science uh, community. Um, Python is uh, used instead a lot in all codes for the analysis of the chains and for uh, plotting all the posterior credible regions, so basically all the regions in parameter space uh, that uh, identify how big can each parameter be. So that's an example. That's another example of plots that we usually look at of uh, like 3D uh, sort of plots produced with Python. And uh, also in combining different experiments. So this, this is, for example, one of the, of the results that, we, that I, I had in the, when comparing um, data from Planck with, uh, let's say, general relativity. So if you, if you see here, this cross corresponds to the model represented by yeah, standard general relativity. And you see that while Planck, the blue contours, roughly it's still, I mean, fine with general relativity. It, it agrees with general relativity. There is some tension when you combine Planck, so information from the early universe, with information from the late time universe, so with other probes, with other probes uh, from surveys of galaxies. So. Basically, you just have to look at the red contours. These combine different data sources from different experiments that combine information from the early time and information from the late time universe. And their combination uh, prefers theories which modify gravity with respect to general relativity. Uh, of course, this is not, this is just, uh, I mean, this is only at the 3.5 uh, sigma, so it's not uh, uh, what you would call uh, a detection, but it's, uh, it's something that will be, of course, uh, of much interest and we'll, we'll, that we will be able to detect with the future generation of experiments that will have uh, uh, much higher resolution. In addition, we can produce uh, maps uh, like that. So that's that's a full sky map of the polarized emission from the dust of the Milky Way. It looks like uh, some, uh, some impressionist uh, portrait, but it's really the polarization of the light uh, related from the dust of the Milky Way. And that's important because this uh, is, uh, in a way, it's a background. So the problem is that, <coughs> the point is that, uh, gravitational waves that we heard uh, yesterday can also have an impact on the polarization of the CMB. So, on the polarization of on this light that gives us a picture of the of the early universe, and uh, this indirect detection, so a detection of gravitational waves uh, through the CMB through this this uh, microwave radiation, um, has has not happened yet. <laughs> we haven't seen that yet, but for the first time we have a full sky map of other sources that uh, can mimic the same kind of signal. And so in the next, uh, in the next months, basically, there will be also new data from, uh, from ground, from balloons, uh, looking at the polarization of, of the CMB, trying to understand, um, again, to detect the gravitational waves uh, also in this way. So there is really a revolution that is coming in the next uh, five to ten years uh, to unveil the dark universe. It's a huge challenge, it's a technological challenge, it's a big data challenge. We have, again, terabytes of, uh, of data coming per day at the moment and uh, like per, per minute in future uh, radio telescopes. Uh, there is a lot of uh, 
th there has been a lot of investments already from national funding agencies, from ESA and NASA, uh, to understand this problem. And uh, again, it's a big uh, data um, challenge. And we want to join different communities, of course, to get the best scientific uh, return. So it's not uh, just about uh, um, one person <laughs> working uh, somewhere in some office. It's about uh, joining expertise uh, because this will actually, in a way, determine, <laughs> and that's a bit drastic, the future of our universe. Whether everything will be destroyed or whether we will expand forever or whether we will just collapse again <laughs> through gravity. And this depends on how much of this dark energy there is in the universe. So overall, we really want to be sure that um, we look at the big picture and we join expertise coming from different fields to understand uh, exactly what are we actually observing. So yeah, thank you, that's fine. So questions? First of all, thank you. It's an excellent uh, talk, really, really exciting. Thank you. Um, the background radiation, the picture you put up, um, is not uniform. Um. Why is that? And, I, and to me, it looks like clouds in the sky, i.e. fractal. Does that mean anything? <clears throat> yeah, OK. So that's a very, very good question, actually. <laughs> Let me show you just uh, the map, the fire, yeah, Ooh. yeah, that's exactly. So it, it um, if you look in different direction, it's mainly isotropic and uh, homogeneous in the sense that it has a mean temperature more or less everywhere at three Kelvin. But really, what we are interested in is exactly in anisotropies, in differences in temperature. This is what is mapped here: differences in tiny, tiny different in differences in temperature with respect to the mean temperature. And these uh, tiny differences in temperature are due to the fact that in the very early universe there were very tiny uh, density, say, perturbations. So very tiny differences in, in, in space um, due to, to, let's say, the, they were stretched. They, it, it's really about the initial conditions of the universe. Uh, just after the Big Bang, there was, uh, there was a phase of uh, very fast expansion, which is called inflation, in which very tiny differences in, uh, in, in densities, so in which uh, some matter was more in some place and less in some other place, were stretched to microscopic uh, scale. And this reflects, this affects the temperature of this radiation that was emitted at that time. So what we really see here is really a picture of the initial conditions of the universe. It's a picture of the universe as it was uh, um, 13 billion years ago. That's the, f that's the farthest that we can go up to now. It's a, uh, yeah. That's surprising, isn't it? Sorry. <laughs> that's surprising because, yeah. um, how can I put this? we would expect things to be uniform unless we had additional information. So in some science, for example, we use probability or whatever. We, we assume uh, equality or homogeneity, isotropy, mm -hmm. if we don't know. We, uh, so I guess, does this say that people are working to find out why there were differences in matter density, whatever mm -hmm. it is? Yeah. It, it yeah. seems surprising to me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you... you Usually when you solve the, the evolution of the universe, you assume homogeneity and, isotro and isotropy. <laughs> and, uh, and then you treat this as linear perturbation around a mean universe, uh, homogeneous and isotropic um, um, background. And yeah, that, that I think, yeah, pretty amazing, I think, yeah. Okay, one question, one question now. <coughs> Uh, you mentioned before that you were looking for ways to accelerate some inner loops and computation and stuff. Have you tried Number, for instance? Um, any other solutions like Cython or 
Cyton, yes, Cyton, yes. It's already used, uh, for example, to wrap uh, um, to wrap Monty Python. So modules in Monty Python, which we deal with data and the, with the likelihoods, with the, the codes which actually solve the evolution of the universe. So that that's already be, yeah, uh, used a lot. The, the main problem is that the region of parameter space it's it's really huge, especially if you want to test models beyond. Uh, um, general relativity, which are still allowed, absolutely allowed by the data. <laughs> and so it's, it's really the process of sampling that I think uh, should be somehow, uh, yeah, become faster. Okay, thank you. If you have more questions, I invite you to contact Valeria outside directly. Thank you. Sure. Thank you very much.